So, Frank, um, I want to know a little bit about your background, just a general story to get us up to speed, because honestly, I don't know you that well. I know you mainly from the documentary, uh, May I Be Frank, which you can find online. Links are in description if you want to see Frank's documentary. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later. But I know you rap with my brother Daniel a lot, uh, but I'd love to hear just a little bit of context to where you came from. So 71 years in 25 words or less. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, the, uh, the, uh, the reason that I, I have any recognition is really because of the film. And, and, um, and uh, the, the, what the film, the film was originally just in you know, a nutshell, the film was originally uh, supposed to be about at the time, um, you know, vegan, raw food. It was supposed to be food-centered. <clears throat> and what happened was uh, at, during the filming, there were all these fractured relationships in my orbit, and that became the focus of the film, you know, re relationships and redemption. Um, and unbeknownst to me uh, or anybody that was doing it, because we didn't know what we were doing, really it was, it was point and shoot, really, as no one knew what they were doing. Um, and the, the vision wasn't clear, but... In retrospect, you know, at the risk of sounding overly sedonified, it was it was uh, divinely guided because we didn't know what we were doing. And when I realized, I watched the film a while back, and it's the twelve steps in order, hmm. you know. And we didn't plan it. I'm the nobody knew anything about the twelve steps. I was the only guy that you know was was in recovery. And but I watched it, and that's what it was. Um, the, the reason, and again, the reason that I have any kind of recognition is because like, like so many people, I've been through the addictions and, and the traumas and, um, the traumas that actually fuel the addiction and then the transformation from those things into the semblance of a life. And, and that isn't to say that I've become an ascendant master or a guru, uh, but in certain respects, I can. I think it's fair to say that I can teach people certain things about what to do and what not to do, and 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 what to expect in in the road to recovery. Where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, in 1951. How many siblings? I have a, a, a brother and a sister, uh, and um, there I'm the oldest one. And like, it was a very very like working class Italian. I didn't know the whole world was an Italian until like I went to school. It was like, it was that Italian. And what did uh, your dad do for work? My father was originally a merchant Marine. And then when he came to New York uh, and married my mother, he was a dock worker for a while. And then after that he started, uh, he worked in a variety of jobs and eventually became a union painter. What did your mom do? And my mom was a seamstress, but she stayed at home in the beginning in the fifties. She was at home, but later she, you know, she started doing seamstress work. Did you grow up like, you know, with a stick pushing a, like one of those bicycle wheels down the street. <laughs> so is corporal punishment allowed in the in, in, this, in this setting? That's a little bit before you died, but you... No, but I did play were, stickball. You were a Yankees fan. I was definitely a Yankee. Well, baseball was everything in those days. We had, you know, we had three teams. We had the Giants, the, uh, the, the Dodgers. Uh, Dodgers, and... And the Yankees and baseball was everything to me. I mean, I would watch a game and then read about it in three different newspapers, you know. Um, and it was it was it was just a, a really a central point in, in my young absolutely childhood. Well, how old were you uh, when you had your first drink? Fourteen. Can you tell us about the context? Well, uh, there there was a I had my first drink with uh, the uh, a friend of mine. My friend Dale Sclafani and and I um, really didn't really know anything about drinking or using, but everybody in the neighborhood, pardon me, the neighborhood that I was living in was rife with people getting loaded. It was a ghetto uh, at the time. Now it's it's a really elite part of Brooklyn, but at the time it was what, really what neighborhood was that? Williamsburg. But originally it was Ridgewood, which was like you know that was like a really Italian neighborhood, and from there moved to the projects in Williamsburg, you know, people were getting arrested in the street all the time because there was so much heroin there. It was this, 
I, I you know, I, I, it was like really people floating on a river of heroin. It was just a, so much of it there. Was it like a classic scene that I've seen in movies of like people doing drugs on the street, biking around, and also playing sports, like throwing baseball on the street? And was it was it a lot of fun? Well, or is it, it dangerous for it, you? It was in the beginning. People really didn't understand anything about. People weren't aware of drugs the way they are now. I right. Mean, this was in the seventies. No, this was starts starting in, yeah, in the 60s. Yeah. In the 60s. And there wasn't an awareness now, like there is now. I mean, most, pe- most people um, you know, know much more than, than, than they did then. I used to be nodding on heroin and people would say, look at poor guy. He works so hard. Look how tired he is. You know, they, meanwhile, I was, you know, was nodding from heroin. And, but people didn't know. So you had your first drink at 14. Yep. And then it was just no holds barred from there? Well, no. Actually, what ha- well, in a way, what happened was I was with my friend Dale. We There was a wino in front of the liquor store. I think, you know, we gave him whatever, a, a few cents, whatever we, because we were kids, we didn't have any money. And he they, he came out with a pint of whiskey. I, and um, I think it was called Wilson's or something. Anyway, it was real cheap, rot gut stuff. Mm. And went back to my you know, where, where I was living in the projects and my friend Dale instructed me on how to drink it. We had a bottle of seven up and he said, well, first, you know, you drink a little seven up, you hold your nose and you take a shot of whiskey and then you ch- chase it back <laughs> with seven up. Well, my parents were on their way back. And so we polished it off really fast. And I got into the elevator cause we lived on the 18th floor of this project. And in the elevator, I noticed something was going on. By the time I got to the ground floor and walked out of the building, I started vomiting. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had no idea that the body could contain that much fluid. I mean, I threw up for blocks and I, we walked to the, to, I was near the East River and there was an abandoned uh, trailer truck there at, at the edge of the water. And this is a place where people would get rid of bodies and stuff. It was oh. bad. And I passed out underneath this truck. My, my parents had called, my mother called the police station because I was gone for like a day and a half. I was just passed out under this truck. And then I got up and started crawling. Really, I just barely could move and started throwing up again. And, I, and so from that moment on, um, I didn't drink. And I remember pa- I had to pass the liquor store to go to school and there was a flashing neon sign. And so I got out of my building and I saw the flashing neon sign and I started throwing up again. You know, I was just like, I was just so, and even when I did start drinking, I could never drink any brown alcohol. But what I did was instead of drinking, I got into drugs like right away. So that, that, Still around that experience, huh? <clears throat> Still around the age of 14? Yeah. When 15, by 15, I was already using narcotics at 15. And so then what, this is, was just like the beginning of a lifetime well, it was, yeah, it was, it was, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I thought it was a secret that, you know, as I said in the film, I thought, I thought that, that the experience that I had with drugs, which, which really, um, as I explained it, yeah, I don't need any words because my, my first experience with, with heroin was, an exhale. Yeah, like I, I feel I normal. I feel held. I was watching um, that uh, Gabor Mate interview with Joe Rogan, and he's talking about um, downtown Vancouver, British right. Columbia, how it's like one of the seediest, right. dangerous, drug-addled places in the entire right. planet. And um, he's been working with drug addicts and heroin addicts specifically, and he said the most common response is, the reason why I do heroin is because I feel normal. I feel right. like, like held. And, you know, and also you have to consider your terms normal. You know, normal is like, to me, I got to a point where I had two feelings. I was either, you know, effed up or not, you know. And 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 so the, you, by the, when, you do, when you do drugs for over an extended period of time, um, you really have, you've lost, I, at least I lost my capacity to specifically define feelings, you know, because my world, both my emotional and spiritual world and physical world became so condensed, mm-hmm. you know, it was all survival and very, very self-centered. Um, I'm just so fascinated about how that could happen at such a young age. Call me ignorant whenever, but 
Uh, you, you're around 15 at this time? Uh, yeah, 15, 16, okay. yeah. And I remember in the documentary, at one point you said there was just a, a lack of trust in your house when you were young. <laughs> Well, um, so yeah. I'm wondering, like, why, what you the first time you did heroin or whatever, you felt a relief, um, like you could relax. What was so wound up and tense? I mean, there was distrust, like you mentioned, you couldn't leave your keys on the counter because somebody would take them. Was it that just you were brought up in well, like you know, such it, a? It, it's it's not just you, you know, it's not just a lack of trust. The lack of trust it, it really reflects a much bigger story, right? So, um, and I think, you know, that there's 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 really some benefit to to maturing and, and getting older. Like, I'm, as I said, I'm 71 years old. And certainly the way I look... You're 71 now? Yeah. Mm. Uh, um, the way I look at, you know, the lens through which I'm perceiving things now is very, very different than when I was 40, you know, and and, and, cer and certainly when I was a kid. Um, but to your point, uh, it's it's what I've discovered, and this is the, the maturity thing, that how things are generational. You know, the, we, we, we tend to think that we look at it like, say, I talk to people and you would think that everything that's going on is a result of what happened yesterday and like, or, you know, like really the and the media see when there really is, you know, there's a background. And, you know, my parents, you know, being traumatized from World War II, they came from Europe after the war. You know, we don't know anything. You know, we're still complaining about 9-11. The Londoners got blitzed every night, you know, and, and so these people that, that were exposed to a level of suffering we can't even imagine brought, you know, bring that into their, you know, their daily day-to-day -day decisions and parenting and whatever they're doing. And to, to think that you can compartmentalize that by just not talking about it. You hear that a lot about World War II vets. They came home and they didn't talk about it. Yeah, but, you know, but you can see the result of that trauma in you know in what happened you know in in the historical um, in, in we look at it historically what was going on with these families, and you could see that the signs of it you know like so it's a generational thing so I couldn't tell you um, uh, at the time specifically what it was that led me to you know and I agree with you I remember. Just for a moment, just if we could get off this for a moment, my son was about 15 years old and he had some friends over and they were rough housing, you know, like one kid, you know, it's just like he's trying to grow a mustache and he had that gap. So he's using his mother's makeup pencil to fill in the gap. Right. And he's like 15, 16 year old kids. Right. And, you know, they think they're, you know, you know, 16 year old kids, you know, very arrogant and his body's exploding and everything. But I'm looking at them and this wave of sadness came over me. I thought, at your age, I was going to Harlem to buy heroin. Yeah. How did that happen? Right. How is that? I was so grateful that my kid isn't that way, but I thought, what happened? You know, it was sort of a momentary grieving about my own childhood. Absolutely, because it wasn't just you. There was like tons of kids like no, you. Uh, in the, no, and, and... You weren't the anomaly. I certainly was not an anomaly, but also... You know, in retrospect, when you start looking at the bigger picture, you think, wow, it, like what was happening? What happened to my parents that somehow this slipped through? They did not love me, but they were absorbed in their own craziness from their own trauma. And so, you know, so when you to when you say like at 15, like, you know, how did that happen? You know, um, there was a, it's, it's you know, we had no good. We had, as my brother would say, we had no good guides. You know, I mean, I'm. We didn't really. We didn't have any good guides, at all. And and um, the people that we were supposed to, you know, I always felt like I was supposed to know something that nobody ever taught me. Like somehow I was supposed to possess this knowledge about something, like about women or about sex or about girls. And I knew nothing. And all I was always, you know, was terrified. I was terrified to More ask money. anything. What? More money too. What do you mean? Financial mentor, like nobody ever talked. Oh no, 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 no! My my parents came from unspeakable poverty. Yeah, and so my father. I mean, I still remember where my father hid the cash. You know, he didn't trust any. You know, those, and they had rightfully so because anytime they signed something, most of them were illiterate and they got screwed. So, I still remember as a kid, my parents hiding money in furniture and the way they, you know, they would they would do that because they didn't trust banks and it was. So no, there was no financial guiding. Just get as much as you can, you know. I guess was the the uh, the operative way of the operative. 
Yeah, so the M O M E the M O M O modus operandi. M O does that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you have a brother, mm-hmm. and was it just you, you, the brother and you? I have a brother and a sister, sister. and a sister who died. Yeah, uh, but they didn't like fall into vices. And my brother addictions, did. Did he? My brother did. Yeah, yeah. me and my brother would, would definitely. That's you know. right. That's right. He fell into vices too, but. My sister, not so much. No, yeah, it doesn't my, look. My like sister, that. not so much. You know, but she had her own issues. You know, that, that her own demons that she she had to deal with. Um, you know, over the years, and um, uh, but she didn't go that route. And then I have a sister who who passed away because she got really into the life, like really, really bad. She and died she, from somewhere between OD and AIDS. Mm. You know, in the um, uh, tragic. It was really tragic. You know. I, yeah. 